Richard Bean, and this is weird lore about Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2 released in 1998 following the success of the original Resident Evil, this time with a new cast of characters. The developers didn't see the original characters of Chris and Jill as what defined Resident Evil, and so Leon and Claire were introduced. Resident Evil 2. We begin the story with Leon, who has just arrived in Raccoon City, a few months after the events of RE1. For some reason, they closed the case on Umbrella after stars destroyed the mansion. It's Leon's first day on the job when he encounters a woman laying in the road. What was that? A crowd of people begin to surround him, and he decides to point his gun at them. At this point, I want to remind you of our previous video, in which we covered that those infected by the T-Virus are not dead. After the woman on the ground grabs his leg, he's forced to shoot her in self-defense, and then begins to unload into the crowd of civilians. Good work, Leon. After attempting to murder the first group of people he meets, Leon encounters Claire. Wait, don't sh Together they try to reach the safety of the police station. But Leon realizes he won't be able to murder everyone in Raccoon City alone. So he gives this lady he just met a gun. Ah, oh, This zombie just houdini his way into the car. After a collision at 40 miles per hour, both Leon and Claire die. Oh wait, I mean they are completely unscathed. A truck driver who has been bitten crashes into Leon's car, separating Leon and Claire. At this point, their paths are split, and the players get to choose which story to follow. Once again, we enter the survival horror. Unlike the previous game, RE2 puts a lot of attention to detail and development into its characters. Sorry about that. While we continue the story, I want you to pay attention to each character, as there's a reoccurring theme that's easy to miss. Following Leon, we continue towards Raccoon City Police Department and pass through a gun shop. Barricaded inside is Robert Kendo, who has an interesting reaction to seeing you. Who are you? What are you doing here? Who do you want? Knowing that the zombies are unable to communicate, what is the purpose of these questions? <laughs> we finally make it to the police station, but did you know if you're able to make it this far without collecting any items, you encounter the zombified version of Brad Vickers? who was the pilot in Resident Evil 1. No! Don't go! Further confirming the theory that the STARS members are infected with a prototype virus, Brad has more health than the regular zombies. Once inside, we encounter Marvin Brana, who is a little worse for wear. Uh, uh. Hang in there! Thanks, Leon. Marvin informs us of the events following RE1, in which no one believes STARS, and seeing as they blew up any evidence, who could blame them? Even given Marvin's critical condition, his priority is to help the citizens of Raccoon City, and orders Leon to go and help them. Just go! Oh, sh <clears throat> Exploring the rest of the station is surprisingly peaceful. For the first time in Resident Evil, we encounter what is called a liquor. You liquor! Zombies who were infected by the T-Virus were able to undergo a second metamorphosis known as V-Act. In this case, commonly caused by consuming large amounts of biomass, such as a large group of survivors hiding in a police station. Sorry Marvin. Uh, uh. On the second floor of RPD, we find STARS HQ. In Rebecca's satchel, we find not pepper spray, but healing spray. We also find a diary from Chris, who is trying to convince the chief of police that Umbrella is evil. Unfortunately, 30% of Raccoon City is currently employed by Umbrella and doesn't want to lose their job. They discover Umbrella is working on a new virus, the G-Virus. Chris, with the help of his friends Jill and Barry, decide to take matters into their own hands and fly to Umbrella HQ in Europe. If only Chris had told Claire of his plan earlier. With this new information, our goal shifts to simply escaping the city. Did you know if we search Wesser's desk 50 times, we discover a film? Cool, what's on it? 
A document from a secretary lets us know that all the weird shit that we find around RPD is actually expensive art worth hundreds of thousands of dollars owned by the chief of police. How in the world can he afford all this? Miraculously, in a station full of STARS members and detectives, no one thought it was strange that there was just millions of dollars of art laying around, including strange pictures of naked people being murdered. We make it back to Marvin, but unfortunately it's too late. Rest in peace, Marvin. Originally, Marvin was going to play a much larger role in RE2, acting as a supporting character to Leon, but that idea was scrapped and is now referred to as Resident Evil 1.5. After reaching the garage, we encounter Ada Wong, who is not dressed appropriately for an apocalypse. Sorry about that. When I saw the uniform, I thought you were another zombie. She assumes we're a zombie because of our uniform. Weird. She lets us know that she's looking for a reporter named Ben, who is apparently being held in a cell. Maybe we can work together. Ada, wait! Ada seems to be looking for her boyfriend named John, who is working for Umbrella, and Ben claimed to have known what was going on. Unfortunately, he doesn't know where John is, but he tells us how we can escape through the sewers. Thanks, Ben. Oh, and he's being murdered. Before he dies, he's able to give us some important information like- Holy sh**. Important evidence about the chief of police. It turns out he was working with an umbrella researcher, William Birkin. Dr. Birkin was paying Chief Irons to ensure that STARS had no evidence of what was going on. His contact during this time would be Annette Birkin, Dr. Birkin's wife. Dr. Birkin also learned that Umbrella had sent spies to steal his research. At this point, it would seem that Dr. Birkin has gone completely rogue from Umbrella. G, what is that? It's a G. These creatures are named after the virus that created them, the Golgotha virus. This virus was first found in Lisa Trevor, who we talked about in our previous video. While those infected with the T-virus are infertile, those infected with the G-virus are highly fertile and hunt for new hosts to carry their embryos. Another important distinction from the T-virus is that the G-virus is actually capable of repairing dead cells. It seems that our friend Ben had incompatible genetics with the G that infected him, causing him to burst like a pinata. With the document addressed to the sewer manager, we begin to learn just how many people were involved with Umbrella's plans. Chief Irons was attending meetings, Dr. Birkin was conducting training seminars, and the sewer manager was tasked with guiding individuals to their correct locations. It's starting to seem like every character other than our main characters are involved with Umbrella's plans. But soon we'll discover even that's not true. Leon, that woman was... I have to talk to her. What the f*** is happening? We just encountered Dr. Birkin's wife, Dr. Annette Birkin. Annette seems to be on edge after Umbrella sent a security force to murder her husband. Ada Wong. I've heard that name before. She then explains that her husband is the one who's responsible for the creation of the T-virus. Annette then also informs us that the man that Ada has been looking for has already died. What? Annette then goes on a rant about just how amazing the G-Virus is, and that the creature going around trying to impregnate people with its embryos is actually her husband. What? She claims that this is Umbrella's fault. It is 100% her husband's fault that any of this catastrophe is happening. Dr. William Birkin had wanted a promotion in Umbrella, but when he didn't get it, he decided that he was going to sell his research to the US military. Risks are part of laboratory science. Of course, Umbrella eventually found out about this and wanted their research back. Days before the Raccoon City incident, Umbrella sent a security force to retrieve the virus and arrest Dr. Birkin. This event is what caused the Raccoon City's water supply to be contaminated with the virus. One giant crocodile later, and we discover a gondola that leads to the Umbrella chemical plant outside the city. Now we can just sit back and play whack a G-Virus infected hand for a few minutes.
Round two. Ada is knocked unconscious as we have our first real encounter with Dr. Birkin. Unlike the T-virus, the G-virus can continue to mutate the host's DNA until it is completely rewritten, no longer resembling anything human. After defeating William, Leon seems to really care about Ada, even watching her until she wakes up. It's my job to look after you. Good guy, Leon. I don't want to lose you. Unfortunately, she is manipulating him so hard right now as she has ulterior motives. Let's keep exploring this lab. From a document about laboratory security, we learn that there is an escape route leading out of the city. Eventually, we encounter Annette again. You murdered my husband! Who thinks that we're trying to steal the G-Virus. And for some reason, she thinks that Ada is a spy. Now, where's that spy you were working with earlier? Weird. You really don't know anything, do you? Well, it turns out that Ada was working with something called The Agency, the same company that Wesker was working with. She specifically got close to John and became his girlfriend to get information about Umbrella. That was lucky. Annette is knocked unconscious and Leon is able to get the G-Virus from her. The self-destruct sequence has been activated. But something has caused the facility's self-destruct sequence to activate. I've been waiting for you, Leon. Ada finally reveals her true self. So just hand over the G-Virus. Don't make me shoot you. You can't do that. In the end, it turns out that Ada did have a conscience, but it's too late. Oh. For some reason, Leon took Annette's virus sample, but didn't take her gun. Ada! And that's the last time we ever saw of her. In a moment of rage, Leon tosses possibly the most dangerous weapon on the planet. Hopefully the rats don't find that one. While escaping, we once again encounter Dr. Birkin, who has drastically mutated. Killing him only seems to make him stronger. Is it dead? We're finally reunited with Claire, who actually found a survivor that turns out to be Annette's daughter. At this point, you might think that the game is over, but we've only just completed scenario A. <coughs> Resident Evil 2, along with having two playable characters with different stories, also has two different scenarios, A and B. This is where things start to get weird. You see, from the second scenario, we're playing the game from the second character's perspective. The story follows a similar path, but with some key differences. In scenario B, you are being hunted by a tyrant, also known as Mr. X. Umbrella sent Mr. X to retrieve the G-Virus as well as kill any surviving officers or civilians within RPD. During Claire's playthrough, we learn a little bit more about the twisted Chief Irons, who had been arrested in the past. It seems that Chris was onto him before he left for Europe. Upon exiting the star's office, we first encounter Sherry Birkin, Help me! who has managed to survive on her own and make it to the police station. A few puzzles later, we're able to make it to Chief Iron's office, where we discover that he's still alive and has a dead woman on his desk for some reason. He explains that the woman is the mayor's daughter and that he failed to keep her alive. She was a true beauty. Her skin nothing short of perfection. You're starting to creep me out, dude. We leave Chief Irons to finish the mayor's daughter before she turns into a zombie. We finally catch up to Sherry, who has been hiding. For some reason, after being restrained by Claire, she feels comfortable hugging her. Sherry lets Claire know that both of her parents work for Umbrella, and they told her to come to the police station. Good parenting. Not to mention that the tyrant from earlier seems to be hunting her specifically, and there's a very good reason for this that will be explained later. Upon returning to Chief Iron's office, we find that he's disappeared along with the mayor's daughter. Chief? Luckily, he leaves behind his diary describing some of the crimes that he's committed. 
It turns out that Raccoon City might have fared better if it wasn't for Chief Irons sabotaging them the entire time. Out of anger for Umbrella infecting his entire city, Chief Irons promises to kill everyone in it. To be fair, as crazy he might be, he might have prevented the T-Virus from spreading further. He made some slight alterations in his plans so that he could hunt the mayor's daughter. And much like the taxidermy in his office, he wanted to capture her in a pose of his choosing. I'm starting to think we shouldn't trust this guy. Sherry has been able to hear her father calling out for her and is afraid that the monsters are attacking him. If only she knew her father's true plan. This game is kind of f***ed up. After opening the secret door in Chief Iron's office, we discover the evidence that Ben gives Leon. Once again we encounter the Chief, who finally reveals what's going on. Shut up! You couldn't possibly understand what's happened. Those monsters from Umbrella have destroyed my beautiful town! Right before getting sucked into a nearby hole never to be seen again. Oh wait, there he is. We get to see a very early stage of Dr. Birkin, where he still resembles his human form. But that won't last long. Sherry? Why is everyone but me getting sucked into holes? We encounter Annette, who after finding out that Sherry is in the sewers, becomes concerned that both the G-Virus and her daughter are in danger. What? I told her to go to the police building. Why is she here? This explains why the tyrant might want Sherry so much. Annette gave her daughter the most dangerous weapon on the planet and didn't tell her about it. Even though I'm an only child, neither of my parents ever spent much time with me because of their work. Yikes, even Sherry knows her parents suck. We find a document about a gas called Pepsi. I mean P-Epsilon, that is capable of incapacitating all BOWs, weakening their cellular functions. Unfortunately, prolonged exposure will cause the virus to adapt. And in some cases, some species are capable of using the gas as a source of nutrition. Once again we encounter Annette, who informs us that the G-Virus sample is inside of Sherry's necklace. Sherry! No! Annette had unintentionally painted a target on her daughter's back. Help me, Claire! Luckily, Mr. X is no match for a young girl. Imagine spending billions of dollars to make a creature that struggles to take a necklace from a child. I'm beginning to have my doubts of Umbrella's strategy. At least what the tyrant lacks in brains it makes up for in bronze, as it's able to survive the lava. We catch up to Sherry who has found her dying mother. Rip Annette. While escaping we encounter the newly transformed tyrant that we defeat using the help of a mysterious stranger. Just like in the first game, a surprise friend brings a rocket launcher. Gay friendship. After making it to the train heading out of the city, we reunite with Leon and finally escape the survival horror. Or so you would think. William Birkin isn't quite done and has reached his final form, an oozing mass that no longer resembles anything human. He still desires his daughter so that he can impregnate her with his G-babies, as she would be a genetic match. Fortunately, he blows up before he can do that and our main characters are able to escape, but something started to bother me. All this talk of Golgotha sounded very familiar, until I realized something. Golgotha was the location said to have been where Jesus was crucified. Why would they name the virus after this? Well, let me put it this way. Jesus came back from the dead. That's right. Jesus was likely infected with the progenitor virus. What does that mean for the Resident Evil series? We'll have to play the next game to find out. Resident Evil. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye. I don't feel so good. <sighs>